It is only appropriate that the second entry in this series focuses on the second law of thermodynamics. Creationists love the second law of thermodynamics, or rather, they love talking about it, even though they don't understand it. When you really get down to it, creationists aren't interested in science. They're interested only in pontificating about it, and few examples illustrate this point better than the second law of thermodynamics. Ask a creationist how many laws of thermodynamics there are, and you're not likely to get a response. Ask them what the laws actually are, and the room will empty quickly. Most creationists are, however, able to recite variations of the first and second laws, and the only reasons that they are able to do so is because they think that these constitute proof of their god, as well as evidence against evolution and the Big Bang. Creationists, you see, are conditioned to recite individual facts without having any depth in their understanding. Some of them fail, even there. Law of thermodynamics, one of the powerful evidences for creation, is that neither matter nor energy can either be created or destroyed. In other words, there is nothing inside the observable universe that can explain the origin of matter or energy. So what is the logical conclusion? Someone outside the universe put it there. Can a creationist look at a PV diagram and identify whether or not it violates the second law of thermodynamics? Can a creationist use his understanding of the second law to derive the efficiency of a Carinet engine? Why then do they feel qualified to pontificate on these matters with bold assertions like all of modern science is threatened by this one law? And why is it that the global community of physicists, while proficiently advancing our understanding of things like condensed matter, quantum gravity, and optical engineering, have yet to release any statement conceding the whole of modern science to untrained laypersons who have allegedly managed to overturn current scientific paradigms with such an elegant and simple framework? Could it really be that thermodynamics is that simple? Or is it more likely that a creationist's understanding of thermodynamics is simple, and that their superficial understanding does not constitute compelling evidence against evolution? In this video, I'll attempt to humble the pseudo-intellectuals who have gone out of their depth with this non-argument. Consider a simple system involving ideal gases. Let's consider what's happening to the energy in the system. When the particles strike each other, they transfer their kinetic energy between themselves, resulting in a new average amount of kinetic energy. Remember that temperature is determined by the speed of these particles. The change in temperature results in the macroscopic quantity that we call heat. Heat is a form of energy that can be converted into another form of energy called work, which can be defined as the total amount of force applied over a distance. It is this form of energy that pushes a piston, or rotates a cylinder, or moves a gear. By turning heat into work, mechanical operations can take place. It's on the basis of this principle that we can create heat engines and refrigerators, which are essentially just cycles of energy that are created by changing the variables of the system in specific ways. So what does this all have to do with the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the second law tells us that when heat is transformed into work, some of that heat is unusable. The ratio of useful energy to total energy in a thermodynamic process is quantified as efficiency, and operates as the basis of two different forms that the second law of thermodynamics takes. The Kelvin-Planck form of the second law states that a perfectly efficient heat engine is impossible, and the Clausius form of the second law states that a perfectly efficient refrigerator is impossible. The reason is the same for both cases. In order to have 100% efficiency, the amount of unusable energy has to be zero, and the second law of thermodynamics prohibits this. The third form of the second law of thermodynamics involves entropy, but while this is the most commonly known form of the second law, it is also the least commonly understood. The reason is because entropy is defined for laypersons in a manner that appeals to their intuitions, but there is little utility in defining entropy as disorder. The second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, fall apart, or break down. Nothing gets better by itself. Disorder is an incredibly vague word that has little applicability outside of information theory. As far as physics is concerned, it has no formal unit designation, it cannot be physically quantified, and for all intents and purposes, it's useless. That's why creationists love the word disorder. Like the words nothing, which I described in the previous entry in this series, and kind, which I'll discuss in the next one, disorder is incredibly vague. This allows creationists to commit as many fallacies of equivocation and goalpost shifting as desired. They've quite rightly pointed out the second law of thermodynamics talks about increasing disorder. disorder. 
And so what we've said is that evolution doesn't fit with that. No, it goes against it actually. And it is a valid point to say, look, you don't start with rock and get human beings without going against the second law of thermodynamics. Mm. When we remove the veil of disorder from the face of creationism, it becomes easy to see just how ugly and incoherent this argument really is. Entropy, unlike disorder, is a clearly defined physical quantity and even has units, joules per kelvin. It should strike you as odd that something that's intuitively described as chaos can be quantified, much less in such specific units. So now the question should be, what exactly is entropy? As I said earlier, when heat is converted into work, not all of that energy is usable. That unavailability of useful energy in a system is quantified as entropy. What the second law of thermodynamics tells us is that when the system changes states of thermal equilibrium, this unavailability of useful energy increases. It has nothing to do with your intuitive picture of chaos and order. And to illustrate this point, consider the universe countless eons from now. Because of the second law of thermodynamics, the universe will eventually use up all of its available energy and will lose the capacity to perform work. This is the universe when entropy is at its maximum. It is an endless sea of particles, all suspended in perfect uniformity. In what objective sense can this be said to be chaotic? I will repeat, all that the second law says is that when a system changes states of thermal equilibrium, there will be less useful energy in the system. The problems with applying this principle to the Earth and saying that evolution couldn't have taken place should be clear immediately. The Earth is not in thermal equilibrium. It receives energy from the Sun. But when confronted with this problem, creationists merely dodge the issue. What the evolutionists have said is you creationists don't understand this because the second law of thermodynamics applies to a closed system, right. not an open system, whereas the Earth is an open system because you've got the Sun's energy coming in. But it's not, is it? You see, They're just, just because, limiting it to the Earth. Yeah, if you've got the sun's energy coming into the Earth, that does not in itself create order. Not if it all. did, you can imagine sticking a dead leaf down in the sun, <laughs> yeah. and when the sun's heated it up, what have you got? A hot dead leaf. A hot dead leaf, nothing else. Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't add anything to it. That's right. For the, to actually get the chemicals being produced, you need information. And yeah, yeah. and life, plant life, information. So yeah. with, with that example, it is not a... And by the way, when you when you go outside of, uh, of our Earth, the universe as a whole would have to be considered a closed by system. By definition, it's a closed system. Correct. There's nothing outside it. So that, that's an important point So their own argument fails there yeah. miserably. Referring to a system as open or closed is incredibly imprecise, and it is for that reason that I will instead refer to it as either being in or lacking thermal equilibrium. The universe is not in thermal equilibrium, Eric. Energy is constantly being rearranged and slowly losing its usefulness, inevitably driving everything toward heat death. That aside, consider the Earth-Sun system. If left alone, Earth has a set amount of energy if we neglect what it receives from its core. As the system changes states of thermal equilibrium, the average amount of kinetic energy changes, which results in heat transfer. The heat turns into work with a certain amount of inefficiency, and now there's less useful energy in the system. The process repeats itself in perpetuity until the amount of useful energy approaches zero. Entropy increases to its maximum value, and now Earth is a wasteland. This is exactly what we expect to happen without a sun. Now put the sun back into the picture, and you get a system that constantly receives new energy. More energy, in fact, than it releases. The entropy, or the unavailability of useful energy, decreases on Earth. But wait, the second law of thermodynamics forbids that. So what's going on? The conditions required for Earth's entropy to increase are not met from the outset. The Earth absorbs about 4 trillion terajoules of energy per year. To put that into perspective for you, the strongest nuclear device that America ever detonated released about 60 million times less energy. You can whine, you can kick and scream, but the inescapable fact of the matter is that we receive more useful energy than we expend. The information that I've presented here was diligently accumulated over multiple centuries by countless hard-working individuals, and even then it barely scratches the surface of a monumental iceberg of the information that we have on thermodynamics. I mean, just look at entropy. We can measure the effects that external factors have on it in an open system. We can probe quantum mechanics with von Neumann entropy, we can explore the nature of black holes with Hawking entropy, and we still have countless more things to learn about it. Now look at your model of entropy. 
How childish and how pathetic is it by comparison? The sheer magnitude of disrespect and malice that creationists have for science is appalling. Be honest with yourselves, creationists. You don't care about science. You only care about memorizing the same meaningless collections of words that have been refuted countless times by countless qualified individuals who actually care about the subjects that you defecate on. Believe it or not, creationists, but there are people out there who are sincerely passionate about the matters on which you bloviate. Science is just a big joke to you creationists, and it's for that reason that you will never understand it. This is the physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. He was the one who derived the entropy form of the second law, among countless other achievements. One of those achievements was his discovery of a relationship between entropy and statistical microstates, which yielded quantum mechanical insights decades before the theory was even discovered. This is a man who spent nearly every waking moment of his professional life selflessly striving to create a better future. Every modern engine, every contemporary contraption, every machine that actively utilizes the second law of thermodynamics owes its existence, in large part, to this man. This is a man who spent his life working to advance the knowledge of the world, relentlessly pursuing the elusive enigmas of the universe. This was a man who genuinely loved learning about the world and sharing his knowledge with humanity. Creationists arrogantly disregard the sincere passion that some people have for science. They will never understand how much effort goes into learning science. They will never understand how much work goes into the discovery of new knowledge. They will never understand how seriously this man took his work. And hopefully, neither will anybody else. I say this because his dedication to science, the fruits of which we are still reaping today, ultimately drove this man to his death. But his dedication to discovery didn't end with his tragic demise. So proud was he of his greatest achievement, so relieved he was that all of his hard work had not been in vain, so passionately did he love the subjects that he dedicated his life to understanding, that at his request, his most famous equation was carved onto his tombstone in place of an epitaph. This is the arrogance of creationism. When you twist and distort the science that you pretend to understand in order to meet your vile and selfish agenda, you spit on the graves of the men and women who dedicated their lives to making ours better.